The secret of achievement does not lie in simply reaching one's goal. The beginning of the secret lies in having a goal to reach for. Now remember that we want to keep things large because the clay is heavy. We want to blend the extra pieces really well onto the main body. Happiness does not depend on having every agree. dream come true. Grace, beautiful. Happiness depends on holding yeah, fast to the capacity to dream. It's coming along very nicely. Let's get those last two legs on before it, the clay dries too much. There is always risk that we may aim too high and fail. But the far oh, greater like risk is that we may succeed yeah. by aiming too low. We want to do. Make it a little smoother. You, we don't really want to be conscious of the join. Okay, I like the pattern you're making there. That's nice. One of the unique things about a museum, and I think you all all feel this right now being here, is that it's a very good place to learn and that you don't have to be sitting down in the classroom, but you can be here actively participating in the exhibit. You can be touching the insects, you can be watching the insects feed, you can be watching them and their daily routines without having to worry about them getting on you or bothering you. And it's just a very good learning place to be. And that's, that's what we like the museum, is that you can be actively involved with learning. Could you touch it, And you don't even feel like you're learning. <laughs> we in America have organized ourselves to help our children develop those capacities to strive, to dream, to achieve. We have devoted our energy and our treasure to building a system of education that will make our country a place where learning never ends. As the new decade of the 80s was born, so was the first Department of Education. President Carter created the long-awaited department on October 17, 1979. We've overcome obstacles and we've answered questions and we've solved problems and we've made progress because our people have always believed in good education. We still have a long way to go in providing a quality education for all American people. I was very grateful to be able to induce Judge Shirley Helfstetler to take over this job. The creation of the Department of Education consolidated some 150 far-flung federal education programs under a single management. I, Shirley Mount Huffstedler, do solemnly swear... For the first time, school children, parents, teachers, educators, and colleges had a voice at the president's cabinet table, where national priorities are set. In early May 1980, the Department of Education became official with a ceremony on the south lawn of the White House. Because of you, the voice of education, the concerns of education, the needs of education will now be more clearly heard and more clearly represented at the highest possible level of our government. Today, let us dedicate ourselves to an educational system that encourages scientific curiosity, fosters artistic creativity, supports research, rewards good teaching, and honors intellectual accomplishment. It is a warm and hallowed tradition in American families to set another place at the table, to welcome into the family circle an honored guest. Today, Mr. President, you act in that tradition by setting another place at the cabinet table by welcoming education, the nation's most important enterprise, to full cabinet status. 
To celebrate the birth of the Department of Education, the new secretary set out on a week-long salute to learning. By such persons as John Bradamus, been able to supply a significant amount A series of, of special events and visits our dramatized our educational heritage. Special privilege, if I may. Spotlighted exciting innovations in learning and drew the nation's attention to examples of excellence in our schools. What's your question? My question is, how do you get dressed if you can't see? Oh, and I got a pretty tricky answer for you. E, e is for the education that means everything in life. It was a day to remember. A day when the first lady and the secretary visited schools that look to the future and those deeply rooted in our past. The education department is founded on respect for state and local control of the schools. Good schools are built by the parents, the teachers, the students, and the community. Oyster Elementary School in Washington, D.C. is one school that incorporates all these elements into running a successful multicultural program. One dramatic example of this cultural exchange is the teaching of folk dancing and artwork. Oyster's art teacher, Carol Huffman, guides the children in their art classes. Now look, this is what the Chinese look like. This is what someone from Thailand has in their backyard. This is what someone from Mexico did at a party. This is what people from Nicaragua have, or see people from Argentina have. Um, this is the, perhaps an example of their um, farms. It might be an example of the way they live. It might be an example of their kitchen. It, it, but it depends, and I say, try to pick something that's different. Show the other children, and now, look. Look at the color, look at the pattern. Isn't that an interesting way they've done the trees? Dunbar High School is an urban school located in the heart of Baltimore, striving to inspire students to excellence. Dunbar High School, like others, begins with the inspired leadership of a principal, Julia Woodland. We have a program that attracts the person, the young person here, and keeps them here. It's a family situation, and we must have that family sort of a situation, the cooperation of the parent, the student, and the staff and the administration. And there is a good chemistry going between the teachers and the students and the administration here. Some students are in programs developed jointly with the Johns Hopkins University Hospital to prepare them for employment in the medical field. Dunbar has an excellent science curriculum specializing in health care, a constant need in the medical center. Students learn physical therapy, dental assistance, and patient care. Dunbar has also received many honors for its outstanding choir. It isn't just money and supplies. Now, you can't do without staff, but you must have that, that human feeling, that love and affection, that concern, that family-like atmosphere. I expect them to do the very best that they can. Just 200 miles south of Dunbar, the secretary visited one of the nation's oldest alma maters located in historic Williamsburg, Virginia, the College of William and Mary, the roots of learning in America since 1693. And that great academic tradition continues today. President Thomas Graves talks about the philosophy of a liberal arts education. If you think of a lifetime as an opportunity for learning, what we're trying to do is to educate our students to think, to analyze, to understand the values of our heritage, to have a way of looking at themselves so that they can take advantage of new opportunities as they come along. I would always in walking these streets think about how fortunate the students are 
were attending William and Mary because these students have an opportunity both to live in the present and to live in the past at the same time. Surely one of those great dreams of humankind. William and Mary exemplified the American college's historic role by training leaders, not just for its region, but for the entire country. Thomas Jefferson, four presidents, the Chief Justice of Supreme Court, and many others had their education here. The Salute to Learning Week culminated in a White House tribute to teachers, those teachers who made the difference. A teacher, said Henry Adams, affects eternity. He can never know where his influence stops. Tonight we have heard and we have seen and we have felt some of that magic that occurs when a teacher reaches out, touches another life, and in the process, touches eternity. What a diversity of gifts and histories is packed into this evening. We know that the President of the United States had a teacher who called him when he was 12 and pressed into his hands a copy of War and Peace. We had a musician before us who has sat on the same piano bench with Horowitz. For great teaching, such as they gave me, touches on more than one subject. It shows the interdependence of all things, and so music became to me a reflection of all life. A sculptor who, like her very own works, is full of authority, vibrancy, and mystery. I had heard about Cubism, and uh, I decided that I would go to Europe to study, and the best teacher at that given time was Hans Hoffmann. A dancer who fell in love with the classics and who found not only enthusiastic audience, but a life's work in Harlem. On behalf of myself and many of the other artists who, who you've trained and developed and fanned the fires to enjoy learning. And we will continue to do so as long as we're on this earth plane. Thank you very, very much. An opera singer whose golden voice has become a voice of world renown. I decided that singing is my racket. And my mother found a wonderful teacher for me. I remember taking a subway ride from Brooklyn to 40th Street on the BMT to sing for a great singing teacher, Samuel Margolis. I was very nervous. I wore a leather lumber jacket, which was torn. And I went up and he heard me sing, a very distinguished looking gray-haired man. And he liked what he heard. And he says, I would like to teach this young man. And my mother said, how much? And he said, $3. She said, I can't afford it. So he said, well, let's see what happens. Let's let him work with me for six or seven months and see if he really has it. And I've been with him for 43 years. A poet of ideas who speaks in spare and eloquent language. I should like first to praise those good drill masters and drill mistresses who somehow persuaded me and others that the, the acquisition of essentials was a hard game worth playing. How did these people who year after year taught English grammar, Latin conjugations, and the notes of the keyboard managed to be so stimulating and persuasive. I think it was because they themselves were not arrested at the instrumental level of learning. They knew and made us guess that on the other side of these drills and exercises lay such rewards as Mark Twain, 
Horace and Chopin. A coal miner's daughter and her mother, who has music in her very soul. But my mother would make all of us kids at night sit around the table, and she would take a stick to us if we didn't learn our lessons. And I think just about every lesson I ever learned was from my mother. They are all different one from the other, but they have one thing in common, a debt of love and gratitude to a teacher. As we honor their teachers tonight, we honor teachers everywhere, all three million of them. It is a mark of our true character that we Americans have made education our foremost enterprise. The new Department of Education is a natural extension of our devotion to education. It will be a department that strives unceasingly for the highest possible quality at every level of the educational process. A department that seeks out models of success, of excellence, and holds them aloft for all to see. It will be a department responsive to all and owned by none a department unequivocally committed to equal educational opportunity under the law, a department secure in the knowledge that the people, the parents, and the teachers of America are our most important educational decision makers. The department, like our people, is dedicated to the proposition that civilization and democracy can flourish only when we are sure that truly, learning never ends. You can see what it feels like, kind of thorny. <laughs> yeah, it feels pinchy, a little thorny. Ha, 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 ha.